In hindsight, some historians actually argue that the U.S. response was, was completely out of balance with the threat which the Soviet Union actually posed. Because even though Stalin had set up communist regimes across Eastern Europe, or was in the process of doing so, he was still very much involved in ongoing negotiations with the Western powers. And at this stage, the U.S. itself is not particularly concerned about Soviet military might. This does become a concern later, but not so much right now. They judge the Soviets too weak to contemplate risking a war against what had become a world power. Sorry, that's another political cartoon about the Iron Curtain. So this is where we see that the Cold War was as much about economies and hearts and minds as it was about the possibility of real war, of a military war. Because the main fear of the US was that the Soviets would try and take advantage of the sort of socioeconomic turmoil throughout most of post-war Europe to win people over to the communist cause. So in other words, that communism might come to be seen as a very appealing ideology for Europeans who were living in destroyed towns, who were hungry, impoverished, unemployed. And again, we can draw back to the aftermath of World War I, when more extreme ideologies gained popularity. Of course, the Russian Revolution, the brief Hungarian communist government in 1919, not to mention the turmoil between left and right in post-war Germany. So in Truman's opinion, quote, the seeds of totalitarian regimes are nurtured by military misery and want. So the US felt that it would need to at once contain the Soviet Union, but simultaneously try to reduce the appeal of communism in all of Europe. 1947 is a particularly important year in the development of the Cold War. This is because we see together the three Western zones are increasingly going their own way without the support of the Soviet Union. In early 1947, the British announced that they could no longer afford to provide excuse me, to perform, afford to provide assistance to the governments of Greece and of Turkey that were both struggling to contain communist forces. Greece communists, and an alliance that supported the monarchy, for example, had been fighting a civil war since the end of the Second World War, and the foundation of this war was naturally located in World War II. The German Occupation had acted as a catalyst for the Greek Civil War, and the departure of the German troops created sort of a power vacuum that eventually led to a bloody conflict that lasted until 1949. Now, although they did not intervene militarily, the Soviet Union did provide significant material aid to the communist side in Greece, and Britain, and eventually the United States, back the monarchist forces. So the Americans, in pursuit of this containment policy, refused to let Turkey or Greece fall once Britain had withdrawn their support. They provided $400 million of military and economic aid to the Greeks and the Turks. And the need for this support spawned what was referred to as the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine proclaimed it must be the policy of the United States to support the free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressure. Of course, it's very clear that the policy and Truman's words were clearly directed at the Soviet Union and the communists in Eastern Europe. That same year, Stalin made it very clear that he had returned to the official policy 
of bringing about worldwide revolution rather than his goal of building socialism in one state. Now, the wording of the Truman doc Doctrine meant that the policy was virtually a de declaration of Cold War that was totally open-ended. And it seemed to commit the United States, possibly its European allies, to conflict in Europe and indeed around the world at any point in time. And it's this doctrine which explains or helps explain why the Americans would soon find themselves in fighting in sort of far off places where they perceived communism as a threat. Korea, Vietnam. Now, the Truman Doctrine immediately posed some very vital questions. What precisely was the nature of the threat that would justify such a full-scale commitment? Was it the potential growth of Soviet power? Or was it the spread of a set of ideas contrary to American values and their designs for Europe? Over the course of the Cold War, these two strands of thinking actually merge into one for the United States. Aside from meeting the threat of the Soviets, Remember that the other prong, of course, was to diminish the attraction of communism in the states of Europe. And this, according to the United States, was to be achieved economically. The U.S. introduced the Marshall Plan, which began in 1948, to aid rebuilding. The goal of the Marshall Plan was to rebuild in the form of loans, products, and services. And it's important to remember here that just earlier, the U.S. had excluded the Soviet Union from the provisions of the Lend-Lease Act. Now, according to the Marshall Plan, Europeans would be, or hungry Europeans, would be fed. The temptation of communism would diminish. A capitalist economy would take root across Europe. But not coincidentally, the United States would have a thriving overseas market for which to sell their goods to. So American prosperity depended on European recovery. So for the Marshall Plan, there were both ideological and practical reasons. The Marshall Plan was one step in the goal of creating an integrated European market, one that could absorb German power boost productivity, raise living standards, but more importantly set the stage for security and recovery on the continent. The funds of the Marshall Plan were channeled through the Organization for European Economic Cooperation that had also been created in 1948. Now, it was not allowed by the Soviet authorities to extend to parts of Europe under their control. And of course, it's not clear how available the funds would have been to the parts of Europe under Soviet control. This is an example of um, some shipments coming in from the Marshall Plan. The plan contributed to the revival of Western Europe, absolutely. But it's important to note that it was one of a combination of factors. Historians still debate how influential the money actually was, because European economic revival had already sort of begun before the plan began. But still, one can't deny that the Western zones of Germany and Western Europe began to climb out of economic distress more quickly than Eastern Europe. Another important development on the economic front was the 1942 European Coal and Steel Community. This was the brainchild of French and German economists and statesmen, including Jean Monnet and French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman. Now, Schuman wanted an agreement between France and Germany in particular, where war would become, quote, not merely inconceivable, but physically impossible. Creating a common market 
for coal and steel, two absolutely vital resources for war. In Europe would achieve this. As we talked about last week, the original six members are Italy, France, West Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. So, former enemies. The European coal and steel community was beneficial both economically and politically. It was successful and it helped encourage the post-war economy or post-war economic boom. And it was a first step toward European common market, toward the European common market, and towards title, tighter political integration of Europe. You'll be reading more of this if you haven't already. New tutorial readings this week. In particular, Jean Monnet's A Red Letter Day for European Unity. So while the Marshall Plan and the European coal and steel community helped strengthen and integrate states like Belgium, France, and West Germany, it also helped to deepen the divide between Eastern and Western Europe, along both political and now economic lines. And then finally came the military division of East from West. In April 1949, the states of Western Europe, fearful of Soviet might, came together with the United States and with Canada to form NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And this would be essentially the strong arm of containment policy. NATO provides a good example of tensions between former friends, because throughout the post-war decade, NATO brought tensions between France and the U.S. to the forefront. When Charles de Gaulle returned to power in France in May 1948, 1958, excuse me, he opposed the dominant role of the U.S. in NATO, and de Gaulle wanted room for maneuver and independence, particularly when it came to questions of defense. All NATO forces, however, were under the command of an integrated, <laughs> or under the command of an integrated military staff, which was ultimately under an American general. So de Gaulle actually took steps to remove France, or remove French troops from integrated command. Now, de Gaulle always maintained that France had not left NATO, but it had only integrated, or it only left the integrated military command. So in this way you see the tighter pulling together, but also the friction in post-war Western Europe. Nevertheless, NATO was formed around a mutual security pact, which stated that an attack on one of NATO's members would be considered an attack on all. When West Germany joined NATO, in late fall 1954, the Soviets responded by creating a similar pact consisting <laughs> of the military alliance of communist states of Eastern Europe. This was in 1955, and it was known as the Warsaw Pact. So at this stage, Europe is now divided into two camps, economically, not only economically, but also politically and militarily. Switch over here for you. Now I'm going to make a little side note here about Yugoslavia. With the case of Yugoslavia, we can see how European countries could, but only under certain conditions, exert agency during the Cold War. So they weren't simply acted upon. They could utilize the U.S.-Soviet power struggle to their own advantage. And the and Yugoslavia's ability to do this lay in World War II, World War II roots. Tito and his Yugoslav partisans, of course, had liberated Yugoslavia from the Germans in World War II. They had assistance from the Red Army, but they were, Tito's troops were a large part of this liberation. As a result, you didn't have the Red Army massed inside of Yugoslavia. So Tito had more room to act 
He became the uncontested leader of Yugoslavia with an independence that allowed him to act in his own interest or Yugoslavia's interest. Particularly, more independence compared to the other Eastern Bloc leaders. Though informally aligned with Stalin after the war, Tito split with Stalin in 1948. Uh, this was called the Tito-Stalin split. At this stage, the U.S. implemented a so-called wedge strategy. And they kept Tito afloat by providing generous economic, but also military assistance to his communist government in the hope that they could use the case of Yugoslavia to reduce and eventually eliminate Soviet influence in Eastern Europe. So the U.S. was providing funds. A Yugoslavia independent of Soviet control ensured that the USSR would be denied that country's military resources in a critical area of Central Europe. However, Tito was not to be controlled. He was able to use the Cold War to his advantage. He took US funds, but he refused to join or to be any part of a pro-Western alliance. He actually founded and promoted the non-alignment the non-alignment movement which we will talk about on Thursday when we talk about decolonization. Now I'm going to back up a little bit from where we've just left off in 1955 to talk about Germany. Because it was in Germany, especially Berlin, where we see the early epicenter of the Cold War and tensions flare up in this country and in Berlin throughout the post-war decades. So during the time period that we've just discussed, particularly 1947 to 1955, events were taking place within Germany and decisions were being made about Germany. And here we see again how the Cold War grew out of World War II, but also presented itself as a new challenge with new alliances. Very quickly, the US came to view and portrayed Germany, their old enemy, as a victim of Soviet aggression and persecution. So the old language of enmity was retooled against a new foe and applied to the USSR. And this was done in reverse as well. We see that, of course, with Stalin's 1946 speech. Each state or superpower accused the other of harboring Nazis and of being Nazis with expansionist doctrines. Those who were compromised by World War II and were closely connected with Nazism in Germany were often among the most eager to jump on the Cold War bandwagon. And indeed, Germans and Germany itself benefited from shifting political environment. For instance, in the West, denazification efforts were quickly curtailed because economic construction of Germany took precedence the U.S. wanted Germany as a bulwark against communism. A very crucial point in this shift, Germany's shift from villain to victim, and one that deepened the rift between former allies, was the Berlin blockade and airlift. Very briefly, because you can read about the details in the text, but very briefly in 1948, the Western zones had introduced a new currency, Deutschmark. Sorry, yeah, 1948. And this angered the Soviets because the Soviets viewed it as a step toward creating a German state. This was contrary to post war agreements, which would then be armed against the Soviet bloc. So the Soviets responded by closing off access to Berlin, which you'll remember is located in the Soviet zone. Berlin was blockaded and isolated, and the U.S. responded by a spectacular airlift that lasted months. And using World War II planes, they landed in Berlin's western sector and flew in food, and coal, and medicine, and other supplies. In the West, there was much publicity about the heroic Germans who stood up to Russian aggression. In May, in May 1949, 
The Soviets did back down, and they reopened the routes to Berlin. But precisely what they feared had come to be. The three western zones, under the sponsorship of the US, Britain, France, formed into a new state. The Federal Republic of Germany, or West Germany, was founded in May 1949. In October 1949, the Soviets responded by establishing the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. So, at this stage, the division of a country is used for the very first time as a solution in the Cold War. Would be followed by other countries in the years to come, Korea and Vietnam. So together, the US and the Soviet Union drew borders in Germany and in Europe and basically created a perpetual standoff. For example, the Cold War, tensions flared dramatically in the late 1950s and early 60s, again centered on Germany. The Berlin Wall was established in August 1961. The wall remained a symbol of the Cold War until November 1989. So you have the 1948 Berlin blockade, the May 1949 establishment of the Federal Republic, and October 1949 establishment of the GDR, and later the Berlin Wall further legitimized the notion of Germany of Germany's transition from enemy to victim of Nazism and of the Soviet Union. To be sure, the Cold War, of course, is not just focused on Germany. As the conflict or ramifications of the conflict centered on other European countries in the decades following the war. In October 1956, the Hungarian Revolution took place now this was due to public demonstrations within Hungary, but also leadership desires for more national independence for Hungary. Hungary's new prime minister announced that they would return to the multi-party system. There would be a coalition government of communists, social democrats, and smallholders. The prime minister also announced Hungary's intention to withdraw from the Warsaw Pact. Now, Hungary was bolstered by U.S. radio propaganda and believed that the U.S. would actually support them in their quest for more independence from Moscow. And they believed that the U.S. would intervene in the case of a Soviet show of force against their rebellion. This did not happen. Instead, unwilling to accept the loss of Hungary, prestige, and fearful of an increase of U.S. power, the Soviet Union responded with massive force. This included 2,500 tanks, Soviet troops shelled thousands of buildings in Budapest, and killed about 3,000 Hungarians. An estimated 200,000 refugees, which actually composed about 2% of the population, fled to the West, and the leaders of the revolution were put to death. So at this stage, the Soviet response to the Hungarian Revolution showed that the Soviet Union would go to almost any length to preserve the essence of Soviet control of the Eastern Bloc. It showed, too, that hopes of U.S. intervention or other West, the intervention of other Western European countries behind the Iron Curtain were in vain. Czechoslovakia also experienced Soviet force during the 1968 Prague Spring. I'm not going to go into details about that today. Um, if you are interested in the Prague Spring, Mary covers it in quite a bit of detail in your text. So I'm going to wrap up by just briefly considering the impact of division in Europe and the heightening expansion of the Cold War in Europe, in Europe and globally. Now I mentioned earlier that in reality, the US didn't see the Soviet Union as much of a threat militarily when it embraced its policy of containment. 
And this changed on October, August 29, 1949, when the Soviets exploded their atomic bomb. And in this way, it was seen to level the playing field between the Soviet Union and the United States. And it ushered in the period of the arms race. And it's at this stage that we see the Cold War, that's been centered in Europe, expand beyond the borders of Europe. On Thursday, we're going to talk about a Cold War world and European decolonization. So, have a great afternoon.